Good afternoon and welcome to CSIS. Thank you for joining us this afternoon at an event on uh, the State Department's Investment Climate Statements. My name is Scott Miller. I'm uh, the Program Director in International Business. I hold the Scholl Chair in International Business and I'm a Senior Advisor here at CSIS. We also welcome not just those in the room but those in the online audience. Uh, this event is being live webcast uh, uh, to the audience at CSIS.org. And if you're interested in following this event or going back to something that was said after you return to your office or any have a colleague who wants to look at it later, uh, this, the, the webcast will be made available on the events page at CSIS.org. You can also follow us on Twitter at at CSIS. I can actually know what that means now. I didn't the first time I said it from a podium. <laughs> but but uh, please follow us on social media. There's actually a lot of stuff there and a lot of, uh, a lot of followers who contribute content uh, on social media. Today's conference uh, has to do with the investment climate worldwide faced by globally engaged U.S. companies. Now, foreign operations are vital to the success of many globally engaged U.S. firms, whether it's serving customers in a market outside the United States, discovering new materials or ingredients, building supplier networks, whatever the purpose, these international operations both support what goes on in the home market by providing, say, landing and sales and service support for U.S. exports, but also contribute to the value added to these companies to the U.S. economy in many ways, through R&D, through uh, diversifying the, their base, and many other ways. The United States is the largest uh, recipient of foreign direct investment, so we receive a tremendous amount here in the United States, and because of our high-quality legal environment and the, and the, the, the importance of the U.S. market, foreign investors in the United States uh, employ many Americans and contribute massively to our economy. Likewise, we are the largest foreign investor uh, as a, as a, if you accumulate all the private investment from U.S. firms. So this is, a, this is a, an important issue to the operation of our economy. The United States Department of State has long had a core, uh, its core mission protecting Americans abroad. And the United, and State Department uh, does overall a terrific job at supporting U.S. interests uh, including commercial interests. One previously unsung but incredibly valuable component of this has been the State Department's investment climate statements. They've done them for years. It's been very quiet. Uh, we've actually shared an experience uh, before the event started that the, uh, the, a couple of us had, which is run into a, a firm who's curious about a market. They had no idea that these climate statements exist. You point them to the, the place on the State Department website with the climate statements, they're suddenly stunned by the quality and the helpfulness of this information. In fact, these reports, which are produced by embassies and diplomatic missions, uh, provide detailed country-specific information on a whole range of factors and topics that are really important to a U.S. investor abroad. Now, beginning last year, the State Department took steps to try to raise the profile of these, uh, of these uh, reports uh, and make sure more people found them other than by accident or stumbling onto a friend. Uh, there is now a, a searchable interactive format at the State Department's website. But last year, we began uh, what we hope will continue to be an annual tradition of hosting an event here at CSIS to talk about the new reports, what they, what they mean, and, and look at them in overall sense uh, how to interpret them and how to contemplate the uh, importance of investment and the, what, what our American companies face abroad. Uh, we're, we, are, we have a, a panel that follows the presentation, uh, but at the moment, I'm, uh, for that presentation, I'm pleased to welcome Ambassador Lisa Kobliski. Lisa is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Finance and Development. Uh, ambassador Kabuski is, is a career foreign service officer. She was ambassador to the Honduras, uh, Honduras beginning in 2011. I got to know her. Uh, she was a, a negotiator at USTR for a while, negotiating investment agreements, but probably got to know her best during the U.S.-Peru Free Trade Agreement campaign, where she was a leader uh, for the State Department and, and for the administration uh, at getting that uh, agreement completed. So uh, thank you for coming, and without further ado, Ambassador, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, Scott, very much. And thank you to CSIS in general for hosting us the second year in a row uh, for the launch of this, these investment climate statements. Um, we love working with you. We work with you on a number of issues, and we really appreciate the forum that we have. And we're very proud of these investment climate statements, which we've tried to make better and better, um, particularly with feedback from all of you, um, either you in the audience in front of me or you in the audience online. Um, the, uh, as Scott mentioned, the, these investment climate statements are prepared by more than 170 US diplomatic uh, posts and missions around the, the globe. And they provide economy specific, means country by country, assessments of the investment environment in foreign uh, countries and economies. Um, and the, uh, we're launching these for this year today. You can find them online now. Um, we have 157 of the 170 already posted, and the remaining ones are coming very soon. So it has been a, a priority for the Economic Bureau at the State Department and the State Department as a whole to make uh, the economic work of our posts broad be relevant and impactful for U.S. economic interests. And when we say U.S. economic interests, we're talking about the economy as a whole, but also big guys, medium-sized guys, and small guys. Um, and we spend a lot of time trying to support that effort. These investment climate statements are a part of that. So um, our um, economic officers all over the world um, who work with our commercial officers in the Commerce Department, with uh, agriculture uh, officers from the Agriculture Department, but predominantly uh, our own State Department people, um, they um, are uniquely positioned to um, provide some insight into the conditions of these different economies and the challenges that U.S. investors face. Um, as Scott um, alluded to, we, the United States, have a really major stake in investment because we're the largest recipient of investment and the largest source of investment worldwide. In other words, the largest outward investor and the largest inward investor. Um, just 10 days ago, the administration was focused on investment at the Select USA Summit, which um, served to advance our efforts um, with several thousand visitors from abroad to attract job creating investment into the United States. Um, so we hope that uh, the economic information that I hope you're going to go look for soon in the reports like these will be helpful to US companies who are uh, finding new and effective ways to enhance U.S. exports, U.S. jobs, and the well-being of American workers in the U.S. economy as a whole. Okay, so um, let me tell you how these reports get used. That would be the first thing. Last year, um, last year's reports for Sri Lanka and Ghana and Vietnam, each of them were accessed uh, nearly 2,000 times. Um, which is indicative of the potential private sector interest in these countries. So if you're an investor, you don't know too much about the country or you want to get updated on the country, you can click on the website and read the, the latest version. These are updated every single year. That's one thing, just straight information for investors. Another thing is these reports inform our bilateral dialogues and when we have negotiations, also our bilateral negotiations um, with foreign governments. Uh, but on the dialogue side, as we're seeking uh, reforms and changes to economic policy practices. We also often get questions from foreign governments about when the reports are going to be released. And uh, sometimes they're concerned about the language um, and they're, they're closely watched. But 
um, uh, we had the instance of a government official from an EU country who said that our analysis in the investment climate statements provided reformers within the government in question uh, with the cover that he needed to push uh, economic policy reform. That's what we're looking for, economic policy reform in a way that makes it more possible for U.S. companies to compete fairly and freely. And um, these reports are referenced in a lot of prominent places in uh, U.S. business community websites. Um, if you want one example, you can look at investmentpolicycentral.com, which is a website launched by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. But in, it, they're re referenced in quite a number of places. The, um, the statements talk about the f these things, openness to investment, investment promotion, performance requirements, um, the ability to transfer capital freely, the commitment to rule of, uh, rule of law and other factors. They are standalone documents, but they're also included in the Commerce Department's co uh, commer country commercial guides. Uh, so you can look for them e in either place. Over the last couple of years, we've tried to improve both the presentation and the content of the report. Last year, in addition to giving publicity, but we did it in part, we had launched the online viewer, which was a big deal. That allowed um, cross-country comparison of particular issues. Um, we've looked again. We got feedback on what we did last year. We've looked again. We streamlined the reports. They're a little shorter. They're about 20 pages each. Um, and they focus on the key issues that are of interest to readers, both in the public sector and the private sector. We've also added some new um, issues. The, the emerging digital economy, for example, we now address that topic um, with uh, things like data localization. Data localization being so that some countries require um, companies to store and process data physically on servers that are physically located within their national uh, borders. So that's one new topic. We uh, have put in uh, more information on state-owned enterprises because in some economies, state-owned enterprises uh, play uh, a large role and sometimes not a level playing field type role. So they, the reports highlight the efforts of governments when they've made improvements in their investment climates. Um, I can give you three examples. Um, in Burma, they passed, some, they passed a lot of new legislation, but they passed some new legislation on foreign investment. They simplified uh, business procedures for foreigners. In Kenya, they passed some anti-corruption legislation. They also simplified their business registration procedures. And Argentina um, lifted currency controls and added some support for small and medium-sized enterprises. So these are examples of positive changes that might make a difference if you're the investor and you're thinking of investing in that country. Um, it's probably not surprising that there are quite a wide variety of challenges that that remain. Uh, some of them are policy that is in the wrong direction. Some of it is a lack of capacity on the part of the government. Um, we also try to look at where the letter of the law dis uh, differs from the implementation of the law, which is an issue always. Um, if I, the, the list of the key barriers has not actually changed over time. If you look worldwide, uh, limits on far, uh, foreign equity, um, corruption, uh, lack of transparency, restrictions on the free flow of capital. Uh, there are four or five more. I won't bore you with the whole list. But it's basically the list you see every year and the list that are contained when we do do by, um, investment agreements or investment treaties. These are the clauses we try to um, address. Um, the, um, for the second year in a row, we also conducted a, uh, an informal survey of our people, of our economic uh, sections to see just informally, so not scientifically, not scientifically, and not for the purpose of ranking, 
but just to get a sense of how are things going in the world. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? And, and maybe our, all three of my colleagues uh, later on might want to talk about that, that subject. Um, I, I don't want to make it too positive, but generally they thought that it, in most countries, the things had either stayed the same or gotten a little bit better. Um, there were only 17% of the posts that thought things had gotten a lot worse. Now these are people that when there are investment problems, the investors come to them in the embassies and ask them to solve it. So it's not automatic that they would have a positive picture. Um, so if you look at the issues that are still causing a lot of problems, um, again, based on this informal survey, about half the posts said corruption was a factor, um, the, um, which is up from last year, actually, by quite a bit. Um, a complex or opaque regulatory environment, um, weaknesses in, in enforcing contracts, and lack of adequate infrastructure. These are all the, uh, the biggest problems that we saw. And, when, um, and what did they think were the best conditions? in the countries that had them, political stability and um, investment incentives. So like I say, it's not um, a scientific study. You can't take it to the bank, but it just gives you an indica indication that things might not be quite as terrible as, as sometimes appears. Um, so thank you again for this opportunity to showcase these investment climate statements, and I hope you will all pick up the flyer that I think we brought and um, go to the website and look at the reports. Thank you. And we're back, thanks. Uh, we're fortunate today to have two uh, expert commentators uh, who will uh, present views on investment, the investment climate, and the reports themselves. And then we'll get into your questions. Uh, but at first, I'd like to introduce the two experts. Uh, first, we'll hear from James Roberts. <clears throat> James is uh, uh, currently with the Heritage Foundation, but most importantly, uh, James is one of the key editors of a complementary uh, publication produced by the Heritage Foundation and the Wall Street Journal called the Index of Economic Freedom. The Index of Economic Freedom is an annual report. He'll tell you how many years it's been, but I've, I've been a, uh, an avid reader of this report over the years. It's an excellent source of, of factual information about the state of economic freedom in the world. Jim spent 25 years in the State Department before doing what he's doing now, but we're delighted he's here to talk about that. After that, we'll hear from Linda Dempsey. Linda is the uh, Vice President of International Economic Affairs at the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, which is the largest uh, manufacturing association in America. Linda is noted for her expertise in the area of investment policy uh, and uh, before NAM and other jobs uh, as an advocate, she was counsel to two great free trade Democrats first Bill Bradley of New Jersey, and then as a, the uh, staff director, trade counsel of the Senate Finance Committee uh, when uh, uh, Pat Moynihan was uh, the uh, uh, ranking Democrat. In any case, uh, after, after their comments, uh, we'll turn to the ambassador if she has any remarks to say, and then we'll open up for questions. So, James. Thank you, Scott, and thank you for inviting me. It's to be an honor to be on such a distinguished panel today. It's especially good to see Ambassador Kubitsky again. Uh, the first time I met Ambassador Kubitsky was when she moved into our apartment in, at the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City in 1984. And Lisa, you haven't changed a bit. Uh, uh, and anyway, I promised Scott that I would take my normally 20-minute uh, PowerPoint presentation and do it in five minutes. So please, uh, Scott, if your head starts spinning, let me know. But, uh, as you mentioned, we have been doing this index for 23 years now, 
Uh, it is uh, one of the flagship products of the Heritage Foundation, and we started it at the end of the Cold War when conservatives and libertarians uh, around the world really wanted to remind people and uh, promote the, uh, the core principles of what we think are the, the foundations of economic freedom, uh, which I'm going to go through. And that's what we, what we do look at are four pillar areas, uh, rule of law, government size, regulatory efficiency, open markets. We, look at, we have 12 indicators. We use World Bank, IMF data, World Trade Organization, Transparency International, and other sources, including the investment climate statements. And the investment climate uh, statements are uh, important for us. We, we refer to them, too. And of course, since Lisa and I used to write them, and maybe, I don't know if she still does, but, but I, I, she doesn't now, I'm sure. But uh, I used to write them when I worked in economic sections at U.S. embassies. And I know that they are good quality, and they have a consistency and a comprehensiveness and a good order to them, a good template. And so they're very useful. Uh, when we look at the investment freedom score for our 180 countries that we score every year, uh, we, uh, we look at investment restrictions, whether there's national treatment of foreign investment uh, pre-screening, whether there's a foreign investment code, and if, if so, uh, is it transparent or is it burdensome uh, or is it rewarding special interests? Uh, we look at restrictions on land ownership. Uh, are all real estate restrictions restrict, uh, purchases restricted or, or are none or is it somewhere in between? We look at sectoral investment uh, restrictions. If there are multiple sectors, one sector, two sectors. Expropriation of investments without fair compensation, what is the track record there? Is it common with no legal recourse? Is it, does it almost never happen? Uh, foreign exchange controls, do they exist? Is there access to a currency by foreigners? Are there a lot of restrictions for that? And finally, capital controls. Uh, are, paid, are profits permitted to be repatriated? Uh, and, or are there some restrictions? And so we assess uh, penalties uh, for um, violations of the perfect, the perfect sort of investment freedom uh, case, which maybe maybe it would be Hong Kong or some one of our leaders, Singapore. But um, in any case, all all countries fail somewhere, and we we make sure to to write that down. Uh, but uh, we we think that economic freedom scores correlate well with uh, increases in and people living better around the world. It's the best antidote to uh, poverty, especially in the developing world. Uh, you can see the heat map of where there is more economic freedom in green and less in red around the world. Uh, U.S., is, uh, seven, uh, our score has dropped in the last 10 years, and we can get into that if you want later, but this is not what really this is about. But this is our, uh, our scores on all these things. The dotted black lines are the world averages. Um, and in the case of investment, certainly we have a good score, but, but not at the top of the world. Um, going down to uh, Armenia, for example, we have a, just slightly above uh, the score you really need to be considered somewhat economically free of 70 global score. Uh, their investment score is pretty good in Armenia. Um, uh, Guatemala dropping down to below 70, but still above 60. So uh, still uh, some economic freedom, and uh, their investment score is lower. Uh, and then you get to a place like Zambia, where it's below 60, so it is really a, a mostly unfree country, and sure enough, their investment score is lower. And then Venezuela, which is a, a basket case poster child at the moment, uh, and it has a, a really bad investment score. So uh, that's, those are just some examples. Uh, you know, the bottom line is uh, uh, that the, it's not just the investment freedom score, but it's the entire global score of the economic freedom index for the country that reflects uh, the investment climate and is what foreign investors take into account. So, of course, they look at the, at, at the details about the investment code, but they also look at the overall climate, and that's what we try to register. Our goal in doing so is not to point fingers, but is to exhort everyone uh, to do better. Uh, and just as Ambassador Kavitsky said, uh, that's, that's the goal. Of course, we want to also, as good Americans uh, at our, the leading conservative think tank in the United States, we want our, our people to do better too, but we want the whole world to do it. And, uh, Heritage has a long track record of being in favor of free trade and open investment, and we continue to uh, sound that clarion call. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. Linda. 
Thank you, Scott, Ambassador, Jim. It's a pleasure to be uh, with you all today. I'm particularly pleased to welcome formally the annual um, uh, work of the State Department on these investment climate reports, which are so helpful for businesses in the United States to be able to succeed in a very complex global economy. Um, these investment climate reports provide manufacturers and other businesses throughout our country very critical, important information um, as we look to expand opportunities through exports, investments, and other partnerships. International commerce and investment are critical to manufacturing in the United States. More than half of the 12 million men and women who work in U.S. manufacturing uh, have their jobs dependent on exports. And exports are highly dependent on the investment that our companies make overseas, as well as foreign investment into the United States. Um, as you heard, America remains the largest outbound and inward, um, invest, uh, inward recipient of investment, and both of those are critical to our growth. Consider that U.S. companies that invest abroad are the largest exporters, exporting more than 47 percent of total manufacturing production in this country. They're the biggest producers, accounting for nearly 65 percent of all U.S. manufacturing output. The largest investors in research and development and capital expenditure here in the United States and they're the highest paying employers, paying U.S. manufacturing workers on average about $96,000 annually or about 18 percent more than the average U.S. manufacturing wage, which is already higher than the average wage in, non, in the non-farm economy. One final note um, before I talk a little bit more about some of the things we are seeing overseas. Why do U.S. companies invest overseas? They invest to reach foreign customers. They invest to participate in foreign infrastructure, energy, resource, and other projects that require them to go overseas. U.S. investment overseas is rarely a substitute for activities in the United States. Indeed, of the more than $4.6 trillion in sales by U.S. foreign affiliates on an annual basis, 94 percent of those sales are made to customers outside the United States. It's not coming back here. As you know, as we all know, competition for foreign direct investment is fierce. It benefits the United States. We are constantly trying to do more. The Select USA conference that uh, was just held last week uh, was an effort by the U.S. to attract more investment. Other countries around the world have investment promotion agencies and other activities, all seeking to try to gain more investment. For businesses, as we're looking to develop partnerships, develop new markets, new opportunities, how do you figure out where you're going to invest, where you're going to uh, seek new opportunities? I will say that, that the work of the State Department with these investment climate uh, reports, but also the work um, of Jim and, and the Heritage Foundation um, with the economic freedom reports are really terrific resources for businesses across this country to be able to figure out what the opportunities look like, what the openness of an economy is for investment, for exports, for other sorts of partnerships out there. Um, the types of issues that our companies are looking at when they're investing and making business choices overseas, obviously size of an economy, the wealth of an economy, geographic proximity to other markets is very important. But the other things that we hear from our businesses, large and small, are things that are covered in, in, in these reports. Openness to trade, investment, market barriers, business requirements. The rule of law, transparency, rulemaking, corruption, the legal system, the protection of private property, both foreign and domestic, including innovation and intellectual property, the sanctity of contracts, land rights, competition policy, including state-owned enterprises. And I'm thrilled um, the ambassador mentioned that this year the State Department reports will include the digital economy because so many manufacturers and other businesses are part and parcel of digital trade. And those policies regarding the flow of data or um, where inf information communications technology infrastructure needs to be placed is so important in making some of these decisions. 
when we look at all of the data out there on, on investment, I, I think a lot of it shows the U.S. is, is obviously remains the, the largest recipient. China had been next, but the last report out of UNCTAD uh, for using 2016 data interestingly showed the UK as, as the second largest recipient of FDI at $254 billion, followed by China at a much more reduced $134 billion. Then there's Hong Kong, the Netherlands, Singapore. Um, and then we have some of these other big markets, Brazil at seven, India at nine, Mexico at 16. And when you consider the population and market size of countries like China, it's no surprise that it's high. There's a uh, hope for great opportunity there. But as, as I'm sure this year's report um, will show, and I know we saw in last year's report uh, from the State Department, there remain a host of challenges that manufacturers see in China. Um, market distorting industrial policies, unfair subsidies, concerns on cyber, intellectual property, localization in numerous industries. Um, countries like India and Brazil started from a very low base of investment uh, back in 1990, and they've grown significantly, but given the relative size of their markets and populations, they have not really grown as much as one would have thought. Brazil has its political issues um, as well as severe and longstanding trade and investment barriers that report after report continues to show. In India, we've seen some new optimism um, in recent years with the election of Prime Minister Modi, who was just here. Um, and some of that recent investment growth we've seen is clearly reflected by that, that optimism. But there have been both challenges as well. There have been positives on investment openness at the same time that India has put new restrictions on investment in its country. There's been improvements on regulatory and customs barriers, but high tariffs remain, and there's a lot more work to do to improve supply chain connectivity. There's longstanding concerns on inadequate protection of private property, innovation, intellectual property, and a host of new um, issues in terms of price controls and other localization measures that are continuing to cause concern. For many countries, particularly those without big populations or geographic strategic location, many of the factors discussed in the State Department's climate reports can and do have an impact, and so provide a great guide, as the ambassador was mentioning, for countries to figure out how to improve their economic success and how to attract more investment, but also grow their own economies. They can't change, countries can't change their, their geography or have a big impact on the size of their population, but they can improve transparency and rulemaking, the fairness of their legal system, the protection of property and innovation, intellectual property, openness. Um, industries in the U.S. and globally are all looking at a host of these factors, including past treatment of investors, the lack of respect for contracts between investors and governments, the seizure of property, lack of respect for intellectual property. Countries such as Venezuela and Ecuador have had longstanding problems. Countries such as Colombia and Saudi Arabia, unfortunately, are of increasing concern to the innovative sectors of our economy. To address many of these issues, manufacturers in the United States have long supported bilateral investment treaties and free trade agreements that put in place some core rules, rules we have in the U.S. Constitution and in our most basic legal framework, but making sure that they are available for all. Having a neutral enforcement mechanism, the unfortunately little understood investor state dispute settlement, ISDS mechanism, is absolutely vital to manufacturers and other businesses here in the United States. It serves as an enforcement guarantee, not just to businesses, to individual investors, nonprofit investors, and business investors, giving us all the same guarantee of the same sorts of things that we have in our own Constitution, be it non-discrimination, due process, compensation for expropriation, fair treatment before a neutral arbitration panel. They work when they best when they are broadly available to all industries and they respect and include issues such as the sanctity of contracts with foreign governments. Agreeing to such investment treaties and broader free trade agreements is a marker, I think, for many of our industries here in the United States of the countries that are willing to go 
uh, towards the path of economic reform, economic freedom, um, and make their economies more open, just as the U.S. economy is already largely open um, today. So let me just conclude by reiterating my appreciation to be here and, frankly, um, my appreciation to all those at the State Department that put in this tireless effort um, to provide this, this really important resources for businesses across our country so that we can grow stronger, so that we can do better as we participate in the global economy. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, just a comment before I turn back to Ambassador Kabuski. Uh, one of the things you said in your presentation was uh, had to do with the context of these reports. And they're not easily comparable, but in fact, the text is quite deep and, and rich. And I think that's an important point to make about investment in general, which is there's not a lot of sort of top line thinking of, of, about investment that holds true when you get into the details. You tend to think of the world as you're either a capital exporter or a capital importer. Well, no, the United States is both, and a lot of both, okay? Sometimes it's thought of in the north-south context that rich, rich capital exporters, uh, you know, build facilities or operate in, in, in poor, uh, poor, underdeveloped economies. Well, look, the leading, exp the leading investor in the United States, I'll make that a quiz. Anybody know who the leading, what, what, what nation is the leading investor in the United States? The United Kingdom. Okay, that's, that's sort of capital exporter to capital exporter, and yet they're, they're importing and exporting from each other. There's a subtlety here. Plus, when you get into the rules and what it takes to, to, for, for an investor to succeed on a commercial basis and contribute to the local economy, uh, the, also the texture really matters of what you're doing. And so um, I, th I think that's a, that's a thing that's supportive. Uh, there's a lot of th things as you dig into the data on investment, you surprise yourself because you thought it was true and it's not. Uh, but the, the, the fact that these reports have context and depth from people who are actually living, living there and, and experiencing, talking to businesses every day about the problems that they encounter is, is a lot of the power of these reports. So uh, with that, uh, Ambassador, do you have any uh, re reactions or comments before we open for questions? Well, maybe uh, just uh, another thank you to all three of my colleagues here. We're also avid, avid consumers of the Economic Freedom Report and the points, Linda, that well, the, first, the point that you were making about the connection between uh, openness and GDP and well-being, uh, it's a very important point. Um, and you demonstrate it year after year after year. And Linda, all the points you were making, particularly the points about the relationship between U.S. companies that invest uh, abroad and what that does for U.S. jobs and U.S. exports and U.S. income is the point we like to make as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Now we'll turn to your questions. Uh, basically, three simple rules for the Q&A session. First, uh, wait till you get to the microphone before you ask the question. Uh, we do have an online audience. We, they will be taped, so we won't hear you, uh, or that audience won't hear you if you uh, don't wait for the microphone. Second, when you get the microphone, uh, give us your name and the organization with which you're affiliated. And third, what I call the Alex Trebek rule, which is make sure your question's in the form of a question. Uh, so we prefer that versus statements. So with that, uh, happy to take questions. And if, if you want to direct it to any individual or the group, you can do that too. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, Riley Walters from the Heritage Foundation. This isn't directed at anyone specifically, but I was wondering um, how might the uh, report actually be used by other countries in attempting to invest in each other? Um, would that be a resource that they, they can use themselves? I mean, uh, certainly, I mean, the information collected doesn't necessarily pertain just to the United States, am I correct? Well, I think that's actually um, an important point that we hadn't uh, thought of. But it's true that it's a public report. It's available to everybody. If you want to know, does um, this country subscribe to um, one of the major uh, arbitration conventions, for example, you can find it out easily in this report. If you want to know if there's an investment law in the country, you can find it out in this report. So that helps um, everybody. But we haven't collected statistics like that. That's a, maybe an idea for next year. 
Underlying that, uh, sorry, to, Jim, I'll get to you in a second. Underlying that is, is an important truth about investment climate, is that improvements in the investment climate benefit everybody in the, who, is, who is active commercially, not just foreign investors. Right? And that, the, 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 many of the reforms that are undertaken to, to satisfy the demands of foreign investors, say in a treaty negotiation, actually wind up having amazing benefits to local investors, local entrepreneurs. I would note that uh, prior to NAFTA, uh, Mexico, large country, complicated government, but they had no, no analog to the United States practice of what we call notice and comment rulemaking. So when a U.S. agency makes a rule, according to the Administrative Procedures Act, they have to publish the proposed rule in advance, accept comments, and actually respond to those comments uh, b before the rule is implemented. In Mexico, prior to NAFTA, rules just came out of nowhere. Okay, so a key interest of the American business community during the NAFTA negotiations was, let's fix that. And in fact, the transparency chapter, which is included in many of our investment agreements, but was certainly included in NAFTA, was, it was essentially to read the Administrative Procedures Act into Mexican law. Okay, it worked. And it worked not just for American investors, but all of a sudden, a Mexican firm, a Mexican entrepreneur, could read the local, the Diario Oficial, and, and understand what, what the regulation was proposed, respond to it, provide feedback to the government, and make for a better uh, regulation. So almost any, I cannot think of an improvement in investment climate that would benefit only the foreign investor. They're generally applicable benefits that if they improve things for the U.S. investor, they're going to improve them for everybody. Yeah, just to second what Lisa said about um, how co these countries are very aware of these scores, and it's not just our index, uh, uh, the World Bank Doing Business Survey, which we use with their uh, full cooperation, uh, and other, uh, the Davos Forum, uh, World Competitiveness Index, there are other sources worldwide, kind of independent third party, arm's length looks at countries. These countries are very aware of that. We, we get delegations at Heritage all the time. We, we work with think tanks uh, that are aligned with us in other countries, pushing this, these uh, openness and reform sorts of objectives. So, uh, and, I, and I would hope uh, that the existence of, ongoing existence of these sorts of indices and the work that state does on investment climate has borne fruit. In fact, we looked back at the investment score, the, the average global investment scores on our index over the last 10 years, and they have risen. Uh, they're still not high enough. It's gone from about an average of 52 to about 58. So it's still below that, that minimum score of 60 for, to be considered uh, moderately free. Nevertheless, there's been progress. And, and uh, so events like this and, uh, and just getting the word out, I think, is important. Let me just add, you know, the, the new issue um, that was added this year in the State Department's investment climate on, on the digital and the data flow issues. A lot of countries haven't really taken steps. They're considering action. Having the State Department flag those types of issues, those types of concerns, is a real marker that we do want other countries that might be considering or haven't even started down the path of considering saying, oh, that's not really good for our small manufacturers or you know, any part of the manufacturing ecosystem, frankly, uh, because manufacturers are so dependent on technology and data, and, and, and both in production and, and, and what they produce. And so I think that's just a, it's a really useful outcome of, of all of this, as well for um, the Heritage Foundation's um, work and, as, as Jim said, the, the World Bank doing business. But I do think the granularity that the State Department provides on some of these issues is, is really important. And, and we do hope that other governments who might not have taken uh, what we might consider less than desirable steps will, will take a good look at, at some of their other competitors as, as they're seeking to improve their investment climate. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, my name is Monica Vega, and I'm um, an intern at the State Department. Uh, my question is for everyone in the group, which is not addressed to anyone in particular. Um, how do you predict the inclusion of the growing digital econ economy in these reports will affect investments in the future, um, particularly um, for those countries that push for data localization and that limit data flows? 
I, 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 let me start. I mean, I, I think we're hopeful that um, the inclusion of this issue in the, the reports this year will be a really strong signal to countries around the world about just how important this issue is to businesses looking to invest, looking to export, looking to participate with other countries around the world. I cannot overestimate how important these digital issues are. You might look at me and say, oh, well, you, you represent manufacturers, over 14,000 manufacturers in all sectors of the economy, all 50 states, 90% um, of them small manufacturers. Why do you care about the ability to move data across countries? Why do you care about some of this technology issues except for you know, manufacturers of technology? You know, our small business manufacturers, the internet is their retail storefront. If other countries are going to set up requirements that you have to store data only in a server in that foreign country, our small manufacturers just won't be able to compete on a global scale because you need to get that data. You know, we have technologies now where farmers look at the dashboard of their tractors. I was one, in one of these in Moline recently, and, and they can see the crop yields, right? And you can look at your phone and look at soil, um, you know, a level of water and soil. All of this type of data is really important, and some of it does need to move across borders as, as you're doing um, uh, production and all sorts of things. And so I think that, you know, we're, we're seeing already an expansion in digital trade and, and the combining of technology and manufacturing in, in ways that one might have not thought of 10, 20, 30 years ago. And it's just rapidly expanding. So getting out in front on what those right rules are, um, preventing localization measures that stymie an economy, I think are really important. Yeah, one of, my, one of my favorite examples was uh, one of my old bosses, Peter Allgaier, when I worked at, the, at USTR for a while, was talked about how much data is generated. Um, for example, each, each jet engine in the air is constantly transmitting data to a ground station about performance of the engine so that there, if there's a need for some kind of over, you know, maintenance effort, it's going to happen. It can happen more quickly. With, uh, but, you know, who owns that data, of course? And, and the issue, I don't, and I don't know the answer to this. I haven't checked it. But how many terabytes of data, is terabytes still a big enough word? I don't know, of data are actually generated every day on this earth. Does anybody know? It's, it would be, I'd be interested to know. But it's a huge, huge number. It's, it's too big to comprehend, I think. No, I, th I think it's a good point. And, and keep in mind that services businesses, and there are a lot of investors that you don't even consider foreign investors who are in the services business. If you ever walk by, go use the ATM at a TV, TD Bank. Anybody recall what TD stands for? Toronto Dominion. Okay, there, there, are, you know, there, there are lots of investors in the services business, and the services business is by and large the know-how business. If you can't move the know-how, you can't operate across borders. And so whether it's FedEx or UPS, which, by the way, are, are globally invested services firms who allow small business to be exporters. You know, why do small businesses export today that they didn't used to? Well, number one, they can find consumers through the interwebs. But number two, they can get paid for their materials through, through international online banking, and they can have these service firms, UPS, FedEx, DHL, and others, act as their customs broker and freight forwarder, which you used to have to go hire those things and build your own enterprise. So these, these are the backbone of international commerce. They rely on the secure, uh, uh, instantaneous movement of information. The modern logistics simply wouldn't work without it. So um, that's why at least I'm pleased. There is a, there is a clear investment angle to the to data flows that uh, if, if we just look at our own phones we wouldn't quite see every day. So. Thanks. Um, so Ryan Ong with the National Association of Manufacturers, and I guess my question is a little bit more directed for Jim, but I think it's probably relevant for the panel as a whole. You mentioned sort of the improvement over the last 10, 15 years in the overall index of economic freedom across the board. What areas of investment policy, investment practice are you seeing the most progress? What areas are remaining about the same? And are there particular areas that you see that are moving backwards? Nice, simple question. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I hope I wasn't misunderstood. What I, the improvement what, that I mentioned was, uh, thanks to one of our interns who's here, uh, was in the investment freedom score, which is one of the 12 indicators. The actual overall score, which is probably one of the slides that Scott made me cut, you know, but uh, was actually, there was a very nice sweep up, I don't know, that way, uh, 
and uh, over from when we started in 1995, at the end of the Cold War period. Uh, and then the 2008 crash, you know, everything kind of collapsed for a while. Now we've seen globally, we're about a little bit better than we were pre-2008 overall. Uh, and, uh, but in terms of, of I, I'd have to have one of my interns uh, get back to you on uh, exactly which, or, or maybe I'll look at it while somebody else is answering another Yeah, question. actually a lot of those curves look the same, by the, by the way, is that there was a general trend toward freedom, toward freer trade, toward improved investment protection right up till the market crashed. And uh, we, you know, we basically, the subprime crisis caused a world downturn. And then everything flattened off. So peak trade, if you look at trade as a share of world output, it peaked in 2007. We haven't gotten back to that level yet. All right, uh, lots, of, lots of restrictive measures came in. You know, so believe it or not, after the, after the Great Recession, we started holding G20 meetings. At every G20 meeting, all the leaders would pledge fealty to open markets and promise to avoid protectionism. And at the next G20 meeting, a report would be issued that says, we found these 15 new protectionist measures. <laughs> so this is the cycle we're in. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, if Jim's suggesting we're now past the 2007 peak, I actually consider that really good news. But we got work to do. So. I think um, we've seen uh, an increase uh, in uh, an interest in business facilitation and, and investment facilitation. And so you, you see it, I see it in a lot of international fora where they discuss what are the principles of these things. You see it in places like the World Bank, which is um, working with countries to focus on what does it take to retain investment on the theory that if you have a happy investor, that's the best advertising for attracting more investment into your country. So if, if you say, what, what are some of the positive changes? Um, I think in investment facilitation, you, you, you not only see this dialogue that I just mentioned, but you also see countries trying to take actual steps to um, make their investment rules a little bit clearer, for example. If I may, I, I don't know how this shows statistically. I'll, I'll defer to uh, Jim and his team to, to get back to us on this. I, I will say one of the issues that is of increasing concern to a lot of our companies in a lot of different spaces is, is this issue about contract breaches. Um, in a lot of t cases, um, companies will invest overseas to participate in some sort of project um, with a foreign government and sign a contract. And we've seen this in the green energy energy space, actually, in, in Eastern Europe and other places where, you know, contracts are signed, um, millions, tens of millions of dollars are invested, and then the contract is broken or the contract terms are changed that make that investment no longer viable. That's not what the investors signed up for when they decided to make that investment. You know, we've seen that from U.S. companies. We've seen that from European companies and other companies around the world. And it is something, you know, it, it's so much at the heart of, of what we here in America understand as, you know, this is part of the rule of law. You sign a contract, you're held to that contract. Um, and so I think it's, it's one of those things that's increasingly of, of greater concern that, that we're hearing about from our businesses. Hi, Ricky Matsumoto, George Washington University. Um, as you know, the TPP included uh, an investment provision. Um, how, could you comment on how the U.S. withdrawal, uh, withdrawal of the TPP affected um, the investment climate of other countries? Thank you. Let me take a wing at that. Um, so far, it hasn't affected anything negatively yet because the other 11 parties at least are talking like they're going to go ahead and conclude the agreement, which would be a positive for investment climate overall. Uh, the, uh, there, were, there were many provisions in the Trans-Pacific Partnership in the rules section, not just the investment chapter, which had which, which were inclined toward modernizing or making more efficient or more up-to-date a lot of commercial obligations. Uh, so for instance, uh, the customs chapter used lots of current facts about uh, electronic clearance, that if you had a, an agreement about, about customs that was just maybe 20 years old, uh, electronic customs were very different then. So those kinds of upgrades were part of the TPP. Uh, clearly, the United States domestic investment and uh, de investment environment did not worsen because we withdrew from TPP. 
uh, the loss for, uh, for uh, American firms invested abroad is that there were protections which had been negotiated in TPP, which because we're no longer a party, we can do. And there are places that are important like Japan, interestingly enough. Talk to anybody at the Jap uh, who's worked at the, uh, at the U.S. mission in Japan, and they'll tell you there are a lot of, there are a lot of in, uh, investment irritations and, and things where, the, the, where American companies over the years have, and it's Japan, you know, but they've come to, to the embassy and asked for help, but, and there's no, there's no way to take that uh, and look at a treaty. So it's all sort of individual espousal of claims. And it's very frustrating for both the company and probably the State Department people as well, uh, because these are tough issues to solve in the grand scheme of a, of a bilateral foreign policy relationship. So, the, so U.S. investors outside the United States in TPP countries lost. The U.S. investment environment didn't change, and it hasn't been implemented, so it hasn't improved yet, but it may. Uh, Linda, you've, did I get that about right? Okay. Other questions? Hearing none and knowing it's a beautiful day, um, uh, let me suggest uh, we'll be up here uh, uh, if you have questions after the fact, you'd like to talk to, to any of us. We obviously care a lot about the topic, but, uh, but thanks to the State Department for this quality work and for actually telling people about it. Uh, thanks to the panel. Please join me in uh, thanking our, our panelists. Thanks.